we're just about to submit a paper in which we've combined two drugs, rapamycin plus a carbose, okay. and that, that gives us the best percentage increase in males we've ever seen. We're getting about a 29% increase mm. in males. A carbose did not improve on rapamycin effect in females. So this is a, a combination of drugs that is working better in the male mice than in the female mice, even though rapamycin by itself tends to give a, a greater, greater numerical effect in female mice than in males. Hi everyone, welcome to Live Longer World, a podcast where we unite to fight aging and boost longevity. All resources and premium member benefits can be found at livelongerworld.com. Now, on to today's episode. My guest today is Dr. Richard Miller, who runs one of the labs for the Interventions Testing Program, or the ITP, which is largely considered the gold standard for testing longevity drugs. This was one of the best conversations I've had on longevity supplements, and in trying to figure out the ones that actually affect lifespan in mice versus those that might be subject to mere hype. Some of the supplements we spoke about include rapamycin, acarbose, rapamycin plus acarbose, metformin, fish oil, curcumin, sulforaphane, green tea extract, and what have you. I genuinely walked away feeling like I learned so much and feeling more awakened from this conversation. And I hope this is useful to you as well in parsing out some of the data on longevity supplements and drugs. Hi, Dr. Miller, and welcome to the Live Longer World podcast. Glad to be here. Happy to have you. You're one of the best people to talk about longevity supplements. You know, there's so much hype around uh, some of these supplements, and I think you're the one who can actually uncover some of the data for us and maybe bust some of the hype or the myths around it. But before I dive into some of the longevity drugs and your work on the ITP, um, I have to say, I saw some of your photography on wildlife and landscapes, and I was blown away. They're just stunning. Uh, so I'm curious, did you, did, is this something, did you start photography at a young age or was it, did you pick it up later in life and did this in any way, shape or form influence your interest in science or longevity? Yeah, I picked it up at the young age of 55. <laughs> it's, it's just a good way to spend vacation time and get to go to interesting places with interesting people. I used to do mostly birds and now I do mostly uh, landscapes and animals. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fun. I mean, the COVID thing is cut into that because international travel is now a great deal more difficult. I, I can't wait to go, to go back. I've been going to places in the United States, and that's good too, but they don't have the same things that they have in Kenya or uh, Japan, for instance. Yeah, they're just gorgeous. And I'm, I'm going to link to uh, link to your pictures in the show notes as well so everyone else can be amazed. I actually send them to a few friends. And so these are fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, so you work on the ITP, the Interventions Testing Program, which is largely considered the gold standard for testing longevity drugs. Uh, maybe before we dive into some of the specifics or talk about some of the supplements or drugs you've actually tested, if you can explain what is the Interventions Testing Program, how does it work? Sure. About 20 years ago, Hubert Warner, who was at that time the head for the biology people at the National Institute on Aging, thought it might be about time to have an organized multi-institutional program to see if adding drugs to mice would extend their lifespan and slow a very wide range of age-associated diseases. So he put together a small committee, about 20 people. We had a conference, came up with some ideas, and uh, the initial grants were made to three institutions um, 18 years ago. Uh, the drugs are suggested by anyone in the world, including anyone who's listening to your program. There's a once a year competition and people can describe what drugs they think ought to be tested and why. And then the drugs are tested in three separate laboratories, mine at the University of Michigan, Randy Strong's at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and uh, at the Jackson Labs in a program headed there by David Harrison and Nadia Rosenthal. We do it at three locations because that way we sort of have, if we're lucky, uh, built-in replication. 
if mm -hmm. we see a drug that is producing good, strong lifespan benefits at all three sites, then we know that despite site-to-site -site variations, um, the drug is likely to work when it's tested at, at someone else's site as well. <clears throat> we sometimes, however, find the drug produces perfectly good results at one of the three sites, but not the other two. We publish that also, but at least the people who read that report are aware that um, there are still some variations that uh, control the ability of the drug to extend lifespan in ways we don't understand. So we screen five to seven drugs, new drugs a year, and most of them don't work, of course. It's very hard for people to guess, here's a drug, I'm pretty darn sure it's going to improve mouse longevity. Most of those guesses, even by very smart people, are just wrong. But we have had at this stage um, four published drugs and two more that are unpublished that give strong benefits. And when I say strong benefit, I mean a lifespan extension of 10% or more. To put that into context, uh, Jay Olshansky published and his colleagues published in Science in 1990 a paper that calculated for human beings what would happen to the average lifespan if there was no more cancer. Mm -hmm. And the answer is about a 3% lifespan extension. And then in the same paper, they showed that if you have no more heart attacks, the average human lifespan goes up about 3%. So people who were going to be dying at the age of 80, they live another two and a half or three years. They're dying instead at 82 or 83. So the four drugs that I've mentioned to you give a 10% or more up to, we're now up to 29%, but at least a 10% increase in longevity. That is about three times the effect you would expect to see in people by a drug that was a complete cure for cancer. So in terms of their potential impact on healthy human lifespan, these winning drugs um, could well be of great importance and great interest. The other things that are, I think, major benefits for the ITP are, are twofold. One is sort of broad and con conceptual. Most people about 20 years ago or even 30 years ago were pretty darn sure you could never have a drug that slowed aging. They thought <laughs> aging was very, very complicated and the aging of the eyes, the aging of the ears, the aging of the brain and the skin, all that is under its own separate control so that the search for some way to slow the aging process was hopeless. It was doomed to failure. In fact, there were six-page editorials in Nature uh, as recently as 1993 proving that you could never have a single gene or a single drug that extended lifespan. Mm. And interestingly, uh, it was only three or four months later that the first single gene mutation that extended worm lifespan was published by Cynthia Kenyon and her group. So the ITP data show, I think convincingly to anyone who pays attention to it, that that old idea was just wrong. That although aging certainly is very complicated in its ramifications, very complicated in its effects, there have to be, there are indeed, uh, some pathways in mammals, in animals built just like us, that you can mess with in ways that will uh, postpone a wide, very wide range of uh, age-sensitive diseases and disabilities and inconveniences, including those that lead to death, and therefore the, the drugs extend lifespan. Changing the, the conceptual framework for that is, I think, a major step forward, because people won't want to look in that question if they think it just cannot be addressed. The other is more technical, and that is that each of the drugs that works gives scientists strong indication of where the most fruitful searches would be. Mm -hmm. So the first such drug that we published, rapamycin, affects a specific enzyme, an enzyme called TOR, and that has, I think, quite justifiably uh, encouraged many, many people to start looking at what does TOR do? What happens downstream of TOR? What is upstream of TOR? What drugs can change TOR? Similarly, two of the drugs that we've published more recently, one called Acarbos and one called Canaglothrosin, um, they both affect something very specific, the highest level of glucose you can get in your blood. Mm -hmm. They don't affect the average daily glucose. What they do is they affect how high the peak is. And one does it by working in the GI tract, the other does it by working in the kidney, but they both do it. And both of them lead to lifespan increase in males only, for reasons we don't understand. That's an implication that 
If you would like to know how to slow down aging, and in particular, if you'd like to know how to retard age-associated cancers, um, pay some, a lot of attention to what the peak daily glucose is doing, how that's involved in these um, broad-spectrum multi-disease uh, aging sets of aging uh, sequelae. So every time the ITP develops evidence for a new drug, it opens a whole new set of productive pathways for people to understand more about how the targets of that drug might be critically related to a very wide range of diseases and through changes of aging, potentially lead to retardation of multiple diseases. Right. And the first point you mentioned, I mean, I think a lot of people are still coming around to the fact that aging is in fact malleable, you know, and a lot of these drugs show that. Rapamycin is one I'm very excited about too. I spoke to Matt Kebelian, who's also now starting studies on humans, uh, people who are just taking rapamycin, experimenting with it. So I'm curious, what did the results say for rapamycin? What was the lifespan extension? Um, and also, were there sex-specific differences for rapamycin, and what was the dosing ske schedule? Well, those are four different questions. So yeah. uh, the, we originally tested rapamycin at a specific concentration of 14 parts per million of food, that is 14 milligrams for every kilogram of food. And uh, it led to, I'd, ha I'd have to look up the paper to give you the, last, the second decimal point, but it's about... 20% uh, in the females and about 15% in the males. It, it suggests that, uh, incorrectly suggests, that it may have a preferential benefit on females. The reason that would be an unwise assumption is that uh, work done by Randy Strong and his collaborators in Texas found that it, at any given dose of rabomycin in the food, the blood levels are higher, sometimes three times higher, not just subtle, but a big difference in the females. So... When you give a rapamycin at a given dose in the chow, you're actually giving a, a higher dose in terms of the blood concentrations to the females. Mm. When you use rapamycin by itself, that higher doses, the best we've been able to get in females is about 26%, and that same high dose produces about a 23% increase in male mice. We're just about to submit a paper in which we've combined two drugs, rapamycin plus a carbose, Okay. And that, that gives us the best percentage increase in males we've ever seen. We're getting about a 29% increase mm. in males. Acarbos did not improve on rapamycin effect in females. So this is a, a combination of drugs that is working better in the male mice than in the female mice, even though rapamycin by itself tends to give a, a greater, greater numerical effect in female mice than in males. Do you know why there are these sex-specific differences? Do we know anything about it? No. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more to be done by pharmacologists. The, the most plausible guess has to do with distribution of the drug into different tissues. Some drugs are, for instance, sequestered in the fat and then slowly released over the course of the next day. Or the speed with which they are conjugated and then made available for either degradation or uh, excretion in the urine. Uh, these, any one of those steps could well be different between males and females in ways that modify the average blood concentration of rapamycin. Certainly, these are things you'd want to know a lot about if you wanted to see if any of this stuff worked in people. Right. And in terms of at what age you take the serapamycin and carbose, I guess in mice you're testing them at middle age. Is that correct? No. Um, no. No, it's not. I mean, um, we have tested rapamycin. In the initial papers, we actually tested rapamycin at two different tr uh, ages. Um, the young group got rapamycin starting at nine months of age, mm -hmm. which in terms of the percentage of your lifespan completed is like the equivalent of a 30 or a 35-year-old person. They're healthy young adults, but almost none of them have died at that age. But another group got rapamycin at 20 months of age. And in terms of percentage lifespan, uh, completed, that's sort of the equivalent of a 55 or 60-year-old person. A small fraction of them have died, a small fraction of them are sick, but probably 80 or 90 percent of the animals are still alive at that age. Um, we anticipated that if you give the rabomycin starting at an earlier age, you'd get a bigger effect. I really thought that would be the case, but it mm -hmm. isn't. 
one of the biggest surprises we've ever seen in, or I've ever seen in an ITP data set was that starting at nine and at 20 months of age for rapamycin gave the same result, the same amount of increase in median lifespan and in the age at death of the longest lived 10%. So it's, it doesn't just peter out at a certain age. Um, that suggests strongly that there are rapamycin sensitive events occurring even in animals that have completed two thirds of their lifespan, of their expected lifespan, that are rapamycin sensitive and can be used to postpone all sorts of diseases, including the lethal diseases, to a substantial extent. We've answered that same question now for two other drugs, for acarbos and for 17 alpha estradiol. Um, if you start acarbos in middle age, mm -hmm. you get half the effect. It still works, but it, in terms of the percentage increase in lifespan, it's only half as good as if you started in the younger animals. For some the younger alpha, animals here being nine months uh, or even younger? For a carbos, it would be, uh, I think we started it at four months, so I'd have to look it up to be sure. And then 17 alpha estradiol, if you started at 16 months, it is very good. It's still male specific, it only works in males. Mm -hmm. But even when you started at 16 months, it's just about as good as if you started it in uh, nine and 10 month old animals. You can even start it as late as 20 months and you get a significant increase. We've also evaluated rapamycin starting at old age with different dosage regimes. In the experiment which was just published, some of the mice got rapamycin starting at 20 months of age and then for the rest of their lives. And in both sexes, you got a benefit, exactly the way we would predict. Others of them got rapamycin in an on-off, on-off. So they got it for one month on, one month off, one month on, one month off. For males, this cycling thing worked great. It was just as good as having it every single day. For females, it was about half as good. It, it worked, but it wasn't as good as leaving the stuff in there all the time. And the third dosage regime was we gave it to the mice when they were 20 months of age for just two months, and then we took them off. We gave them a a hit, a pulse. For males, it worked great. It was just as good, but for females, it only works half as well. Okay. We don't know why, and it would be nice to know. Uh, I would love to know. All right. it, it, is, it may well be different in mice, in humans, in dogs. These are likely to be um, molded by sex-specific enzymes and sex-specific excretory pathways that are probably going to be quite different from the, in every species. And what was the reason for picking monthly dosing? Uh, did you think to do maybe weekly dosing testing as well? It was arbitrary. We just said, let's try on, off, on, off, on, off. And we said, let's, let's change it every month. On the first of the month, it's easy to remember. We don't know if it's the best. We don't know if it's the second best. It's just what we tried. But one of the problems is when you have a winning drug and we rapamycin, a carbos, and canagliflozin, and, and 17 alpha estradiol are all winning drugs in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, there's an awful lot of cool stuff you really want to do. You want to start it in youth and then turn it off when they get to be middle-aged, or you want to give it uh, once a month and then uh, repeat again one month, and you want to try all these different variations, and that's too expensive. So we, we pick a couple of variations that we think are most likely to be informative, and we give those a try. So rapamycin and acarbose, uh, the combination of the two, you said you tested those as well. What was the dosing schedule for that? Uh, we gave rapamycin plus acarbose starting from nine months of age, and we gave it every day until the mice died. Um, when you do that, you get the longest lived males we ever got, and we get females that live just as long as rapamycin by itself would, would do for them. We also did that at 16 months of age, and it was a little puzzling. For 16 months of age for females, it worked great. For 16 months of age at males, it didn't. It didn't work at all. And, or it did, just barely. It really, it was significant statistically, but it was a disappointingly small effect. And we don't know why. In our class, in our, in our um, ITP labs, the males are not as long-lived as the females. And mm -hmm. it's possible that starting at 16 months is just too close to the a expected age of death for a lot of the male mice. So it may be asking an awful lot of rapamycin started that late in male mice 
to have a big effect. It did so in our 2009 paper, but this time around it did not. And it's, and it was as good as rapamycin, but no better. Right. And are you thinking of combining maybe rapamycin and estradiol or um, some of the other? I know you're probably thinking of combining rapamycin and metformin for the new cohort. Yeah, uh, so those are two questions. Uh, I think combinations of drugs are a good idea. In particular, if people have a biochemical rationale for thinking that the two may have non-overlapping side effects or non-overlapping pathways that lead to benefit, uh, or if one opposes the side effects of the other, all of those are good rationales. We, we are always dependent on the scientific community to propose to us combinations of drugs. And in fact, the last group of proposals that came in had uh, quite a number where somebody said, test drug X plus drug Y, and here why, here's why I think it's uh, a good idea. You mentioned in particular rapamycin plus metformin. We actually did test that, um, and the results were um, a little hard to interpret. Metformin had no, by itself, has no effect on mouse lifespan, no benefit, at least at the dose we tested. It's possible that at some other dose, it might have been good, but at the dose we tested, uh, it had no benefit by itself. Now, when you combine it with metformin, I'm uh, sorry, uh, with rapamycin, so you have metformin plus rapamycin, it gave a slightly increased lifespan in the males, but it was not statistically significant. So um, we can't say, look, we've got strong evidence that the two put together do better than rapamycin by itself. It, there was a sort of a hint that that might be correct, but it didn't rise to the standards expected for um, strong conclusions. So we published it and people can draw their own conclusion. Okay. So going back to the four winning drugs that you spoke about, you said that Ircabos, what did what it's doing is blunting the peak glucose levels. It's not just about yeah. keeping it, I mean, your glucose levels to a certain level. It's about blunting the peak level. What about estradiol? What is the mechanism by which you think it acts as a longevity supplement? That's a very good question. And we really don't know. And we would love to know. Um, it, everybody knows about 17 beta estradiol. It's people call it estrogen. It's a very famous sex hormone, higher levels in females. So 17-alpha estradiol, which is what we used, is very similar, but one of the hydroxyl groups points up in the opposite direction. So for that reason, it does not do a great job of binding to the classical estrogen receptors, and it's relatively non-feminizing. I'm no expert in this, but it's either tenfold worse or a hundredfold worse at stimulating uh, estrogenic effects in mice. So we gave it to the mice in the hopes, this was a reasonable idea, but it was wrong, you know, the hopes that it would move the lifespan of male mice to the same slightly higher level that female mice get on their own. Mm -hmm. In fact, it didn't do that. It did much better. That is, male mice, given 17 alpha estradiol, have lifespan changes that push them way better than female mice, whether the female mice are on the drug or not. The drug has no effect on females, on lifespan in females. So we don't know what the target is. We don't know whether the target is a cell in the brain or a cell in the pancreas or, some, or in the liver or something. We have one important clue, which we're now following up on. Um, Mike Garrett, who was in my lab at the time, collaborated with a guy named Mo Jane, uh, who is a, an expert on metabolomics, and he gave uh, Mo the tissues from these mice. He said, what has changed in the steroids? And there was a very interesting response. There are a couple of steroids that are related to 17-alpha estradiol. They're in the estriol class. And they went way, way up in the male mice that got 17-alpha estradiol. They went up 20-fold. But they didn't go up in females. So when you have a male mouse and it gets 17-alpha estradiol, the chemical we give them, suddenly these estriols shoot to the sky, and that's a male-specific response. Apparently, only the males have whatever enzyme it takes to turn the 17-alpha estradiol into the est estriol derivatives. So the best guess is that it is that, that that's the good stuff, the estriol produced by males only, 
may be accomplishing the health benefits that you see in the males only. So the obvious experiment to do, which is the one we're now doing, is to give both male and female mice the estriol. And if, in fact, these estriols are the active ingredient, the product of metabolism of semitinyl estradiol, then they might work in both sexes. That's certainly our hope. But we don't know where the target is. Um, it's a reasonable guess that it's having some effect on one of the many uh, 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 parts of the brain that regulate metabolism and health. But that's not saying very much. And clearly there's a, a whole world of experimentation that needs to be done to sort of nail down, specify, and then test that idea. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So what's the fourth one then? We've discussed uh, rapamycin acrobos. Canagliflozin. Yeah, we, we published canagliflozin last year. Um, this is a drug that's given to human diabetics, and it's become a very popular drug in the last few years. Each of the major companies makes a version of it, different chemically, but with the same target. The way it assists diabetics is it affects reabsorption in the kidney of glucose. So that, um, you know, it's very dangerous for diabetics to have a high glucose level in their blood. So what the, when the glucose goes really high in the blood, it, it tends to be lost uh, by the kidney if this drug is present. It poisons the part of the kidney that reabsorbs glucose. And so it's harder to get glucose way, way, way up if you've taken canagliflozin, and you can see why this would be good for diabetics. Mm -hmm. So there are hints here and there in the literature, a few papers uh, on cancer and a few papers on heart attacks and strokes, suggesting that in addition to the benefit canagliflozin has on diabetic people, it may have subsidiary benefits for cancer, for strokes, for heart attack, for a lot of other stuff. In any case, our mice are not dying of diabetes. They don't get diabetes. About 80% of them are dying of some form of cancer. There are many kinds of cancer in these mice, but about 80% of the deaths are attributable to cancer. Canagliflozin is extending the lifespan uh, of the male mice and is doing so presumably by inhibiting cancer plus a lot of other bad things that happen to mice. Whether it's doing so by blocking peak glucose, that's our guess, or whether it's that plus something else, we would need to sort out. We've just completed a study, we haven't published it yet, involving a collaboration with two experts at the University of Washington on veterinary pathology, Warren Latigus and Jessica Snyder. Uh, they were given um, animals that had been euthanized at 22 months of age, half of them on canagliflozin, half of them not on canagliflozin. And they found seven kinds of diseases, one in the adrenal, one in the heart, one in the vessels, one in the liver, one in the kidneys, um, and one in the pancreas. They went up with age uh, in both sexes, and canagliflozin blocked them, but in males only. So it's <laughs> clear that the ability of canagliflozin to extend lifespan in males is accompanied by, and one would guess caused by, its ability to block a very large range of age-associated pathological changes. Now, why that is seen only in the males is uncertain. So, it sounds like acarbose is doing the same thing as well, right? Both in terms of blocking peak glucose levels. Yeah, that's, I think, the best guess. The reason we wanted to test canagliflozin was to see whether the acarbose benefit was due to the blockage of peak glucose. A carbose produces it by an action in the GI tract to slow an absorption of glucose, and canagliflozin instead alters absorption, reabsorption of glucose by the kidney. So since they both work, and the one thing they clearly have in common is their ability to interfere with the highest levels of glucose after the mice eat a big carbohydrate meal, it's a reasonable guess that it is the inhibition of peak glucose that is the critical thing, but we don't know why that's male specific, and we don't really know how inhibition of peak glucose can inhibit cancer and vessel changes and heart changes and kidney changes and adrenal changes. All of that needs to be worked out. 
Do you know if there could be any side effects if non-diabetics are taking these two drugs? Oh, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that. But in diabetic patients, both drugs are, are thought to be really quite safe. Um, there's a side effect from a carbose because it changes the bacteria in your gut. It tends to make you flatulent and makes you have a, a, a particularly if you eat wheat as your main carbohydrate source, it tends to produce gastrointestinal upset. Um, that's one of the reasons why the drug is uh, more favored in countries where rice is the principal carbohydrate source. Countries like India, parts of China, other mm -hmm. uh, Asian countries um, where rice is the main carbohydrate source, a carbo is a lot more popular because it doesn't tend to produce bloating. Right. I, I grew up eating a lot of white rice. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, one question I had is, what was the lifespan extension you saw with conagroflazin and um, at what age was it given to mice? Well, in the initial studies, uh, again, I'd have to look it up. I think we started at six or seven months of age in young adults. And the percentage lifespan extension in the males was, I think, about 15%. We would certainly like to know whether it will also have a benefit when you start at a later age. So, so we now have some groups of mice that are getting conagliflozin starting only at 16 months of age, as late as 16 months of age. And it'll be a year or more before we know whether it has the same benefit, zero benefit, or something in the middle. Okay. So do you take any of these for winning drugs? Yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but people, when people ask that question, is they're asking secretly, should I take them? Should my That's friends right. take them? And I'm not a doctor. <laughs> and the correct legal and I think ethical answer is to say, if you think these are good for you, you should talk to your doctor and see if you and your doctor agree on, on these matters. Uh, each individual person will have his or her own risk tolerance, uh, ideas about how important it is to take specific drugs and a physician, physician's opinion needs to be consulted. Absolutely. No. Um, all right. So we've discussed. I do recommend green vegetables and exercise and not smoking. 100%. Or else. For sure. sure. Yes. Um, okay. So we've discussed the four winning ones um, that you, you spoke about the data there. What about some of the ones that don't work and i do want to discuss that because there's just so much controversy around some of them for example um resveratrol is one and then well, before we get to that uh, i i've told you the four that had the biggest effect but we have um three others which produced significant effects mm -hmm. and which could well spark interesting new research okay um, yeah let's talk about this was a molecule called ndga it's mm -hmm. nor dihydro glyuretic acid, NDGA. It works three times in a row, so it really, really works. But it only produces about a 12% increase in lifespan, and it's male-specific. It's quite expensive. And so once we had other things that worked better, we haven't really been studying NDGA, but it, it clearly has some effects. What Second, is it? What does it do? It's an antioxidant, and it has anti-inflammatory properties. So... We don't know whether the benefits are because it's an antioxidant or because it's anti-inflammatory or because of both or because of neither, but it has been studied in the past as an antioxidant and as an anti-inflammatory. Okay. The second is, is a famous amino acid, glycine. Mm -hmm. uh, if you put an enormous amount of glycine to the diet, that 6% of the weight of the diet is glycine, it produces a small benefit. It, now, the benefit is seen at all three sites. It's seen in males and females. It affects both the average lifespan and the lifespan of the oldest animals. So it's really, really there, but mm -hmm. it's small. It's only about 5%. So, um, again, we have put that, you know, uh, to the back burner, so to speak, because the effect size is quite small, and uh, we have other things which have a bigger effect. The last of these, which is not published, which will be submitted for publication, I hope, in a couple of weeks, is a, an antihypertensive drug called captopril. It's, it's used in people as an antihypertensive aid. The studies that we've just finished used only a single dose. And in the male mice, it didn't produce a real benefit. In the females, 
it did produce a real benefit, but a small one, about 5%. So my guess is, and it's only a guess, is that when we try higher doses of captopril next year, for instance, when we try higher doses, it may work better in females, may even begin to work in males. So I'm, I don't want to give up on it, even though the initial results were in one sex only and quantitatively kind of small, you know, it's a lead. And uh, we don't think it's, if it's, if it's working at all, we don't think it's working as an antihypertensive agent, but it may be working through other pathways that deserve a lot of attention. Hmm. And are you going to test any of these in combination with maybe some of the four winning drugs? Yeah, all of those would be good ideas. Uh, I think before I, before we study something like captopril plus rapamycin, I want to be darn sure that captopril really works. Uh, I want to repeat the study at higher doses and uh, see if we can replicate and hopefully improve upon the sort of yeah, maybe there, maybe not there results that we got uh, when we studied it starting in uh, 2017. Yeah, and I think one of the things you mentioned is it's going to uncover some of the pathways that maybe we can study. So for yeah. future research, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, if we use a higher dose and now we're getting a 20% increase in females and a 10% increase in males, then that will justify and help guide much more intensive research into the targets and how they might be related to a variety of uh, of potential anti-aging mechanisms. One of the things I didn't mention to you, but I think is very important, now that we have at least four drugs that slow aging and at least two or uh, three mutations that slow aging and two diets that slow aging, for the first time we can begin to ask what mechanisms do they have in common? So some people in my lab, for instance, are really interested in um, a molecule called uh, GPLD1. The liver produces it, and it goes to the brain, and it improves uh, production of new neurons. Well, uh, the scientist, her name is Jina Li, L-I, has found that GPLD1 is turned on by the mutant genes, that's good, and it's turned on by the drugs, that's good too. So that suggests, and, and by caloric restriction, so that suggests strongly that it may be a major player in the prolongation of of life, healthy lifespan, regardless of whether you're doing that genetically or pharmacologically or through a dietary manipulation. If that's the case, then looking at drugs that specifically elevate that protein will be a worthwhile pursuit. The Having a, at one's fingertips multiple genes, multiple drugs, and at least two diets, caloric restriction, methiamine restriction, the mm -hmm. extent lifespan, for the first time, makes it possible to look for shared mechanisms. Figuring out how caloric restriction works has been an enormous headache for 70 years because caloric restriction does so many things. And proving that this one but not that one is the connection to aging has proven very frustrating. But now that we have multiple ways, quite different ways of slowing aging and extending lifespan, at least in mice, we can start to see what things they have in common and that helps us very much uh, focus our attention on plausible links rather than just idiosyncrasies of each of the, of the techniques we're using. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. I haven't heard anyone talk about what, or answer, ask the question, what are the shared mechanisms connecting mutant genes and diet, longevity diets and also longevity drugs. So that's, that's amazing. Are there, is there, uh, outside of GPLT2, um, is there anything else that, you notice is shared among these three or maybe even among oh, yeah. two of them. That's, that's what everyone in my lab does. Uh, we have several good leads. I can mention them uh, if, if you think your listeners would be interested. Uh, there's a guy mm -hmm. named Joe Endicott who works on chaperone mediated autophagy and uh, he's found with collaborators that there's high levels of chaperone mediated autophagy in uh, the mutant mice and also with three of the four drugs they also turn it on. There's a guy in the lab named Gonzalo Garcia. He is interested in controlled translation, that is selective translation of some specific messenger RNAs, and he's found that they too are augmented. These selective RNA translation events are augmented by the drugs, by, by all of them, acarbose, rapamycin, and 17-alpha estradiol, 
as well as by the two mutant genes. Uh, interestingly, both Joe Endicott's work and Gonzalo Garcia's work are not looking at transcription. They're not looking at what genes are transcribed from DNA, which is what most other people do, but at what happens in terms of translation, which messenger RNAs get translated into proteins, that's Gonzalo's work, and uh, once the protein is there, what things chop it up and throw it away, which is what uh, Joe Endicott is doing. These non-transcriptional changes may be, we think, a really important shared common mechanism, and tying them together is the GPLD1 stuff that Gina Lee has done, because the GPLD1, turned on by the genes, turned on by the drugs, turns out to be one of those rare proteins whose translation is controlled by the mechanism Garcia is studying, cap independent translation, so mm -hmm. that we didn't know that when we started, but uh, Gina's work has now shown quite nicely, very exciting stuff, that the um, selective RNA translation that we've been studying for other reasons, which is characteristic of all sorts of slow aging mice, that turns out to be the trick for getting a lot of GPLD1 in the blood. Uh, and and when, when it's in the blood, neurogenesis uh, and brain cell health maintenance are, are augmented. Someone else discovered that, but we've confirmed it. So we could potentially maybe use some sort of mRNA techniques to turn that on as well and turn on GPLD1. Yes, uh, what we want. We have one already, but we want a lot more. We want a drug, we want 10 drugs, okay. that right. selectively promote the translation of these CAP-independent messenger RNAs. I, no one really knows what fraction of the mRNAs can be translated in this way. We have about 10 proteins that we know are translated in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the, there may well be 100 or 200 or more. But what we really want is a drug that will turn those on because Gonzalo has shown that uh, they are turned on both in the slow aging mutants and in mice exposed to rapamycin, acarbose, and 17 alpha estradiol. It's interesting, you know, 17 alpha estradiol, as, as we've mentioned, is male specific. It only has a lifespan benefit in the males. Gonzalo has found that it turns on this kind of translation in male mice only. So that's a really nice match for uh, the health benefit, which is also male-specific for that particular drug. And you said this GPLD1 is produced naturally by the liver. What is that something that's going on with age? It's known that it's produced by the liver. Jenna has found that it is also produced by the fat, and we don't know whether that's important or not, <laughs> but it is produced in the fat, and in the fat it is also produced by CAP-independent translation. I don't know whether it changes with age. The people who are studying it, both in mice and humans, are really excited by it because it's turned on by exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody sort of understands that getting a lot of exercise is good for you, and there are some very well-qualified labs that say, yeah, it's good for you because it encourages the production of GPLD1. And in fact, animals that exercise make more GPLD1, and it's, there's more of it in their plasma. And there's at least speculation that that may promote healthy brain aging too. That's someone else's work, and I don't, I don't have the skills or the knowledge to say whether it's right or wrong, but that's what they've concluded. In our work in the mice, we noted that the anti-aging drugs turn on GPLD1 and also turn on two indicators of, of healthy brain aging. Uh, we suspect that's cause and effect, though we haven't proven that yet. Fantastic. That's a beautiful link. I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it. All right. Um, maybe some of the ones that oh, don't work, some of the longevity drugs that you've tested, um, one that I brought up was resveratrol. What did you see in the ITP lab? Uh, and resveratrol had no effect on lifespan in mice. We uh, uh, were told to test it starting at young ages and at middle ages, like four or 12 months, didn't matter. We were told to test it at a high concentration and at a very high concentration. We did that. It didn't matter. Then the group of Rafa de Cabo, who uh, is at NIH, uh, they tested it in normal mice. It had no effect, no benefit. 
uh, Rafa's group with David Sinclair had published a very famous, very high profile paper uh, claiming that resveratrol extended lifespan in mice, but they used mice that were on a diet that had 60% coconut oil. And um, they didn't mention it at the time, but these mice are really short lived. And what they're dying of is a fatty liver. The coconut oil concentration in their diet is so high, the liver expands and crushes their lungs. The lungs get compressed by this fatty, fatty diet to the point where the animals cannot inhale, they cannot breathe. So they are dying of coconut oil poisoning and resveratrol apparently works pretty well for that. If, if you are <laughs> find yourself in a place where there's nothing to eat except coconut oil, that would be the circumstance in which resveratrol might be worth a clinical trial. But um, it, uh, otherwise, it's, it's hard to say that it has ever had any benefit in mice. I, I don't know what happened in the human studies. I know that there was a company called Sertris that appeared to be making great progress at developing um, sirtuin uh, activators like resveratrol. They sold it to GlaxoSmithKline for something like 600 million bucks. <laughs> and Glaxo found that they could not replicate any of the findings and they closed the, that part of the company and took a $600 million tax write-off because the idea that sirtuin activating agents was good for you was not something they could confirm. So the same is said for NR and NMN, at least some scientists in the field would say that that's also activating sirtuins. Uh, did you try NR and NMN in the lab as well? We published, the ITP published a paper, mm -hmm. we gave NR, nicotinamide riboside, mm -hmm. to mice, and it had no benefit. Um, we have not tried NMN yet. Uh, no one has proposed it to us. Um, I know that there are companies that are pushing it. They've got beautiful websites, a lot of glossy bottles with ultra, ultra pure stuff in it. What I haven't seen yet is any evidence that their stuff actually is good for you. Right. Because the FDA will allow you, as long as you don't say it, it uh, treats or cures or prevents a disease, you can wink and sort of let people know, yeah, it really does, but you don't actually have to have any evidence for that. So you can make a lot of money pushing the stuff, but I don't know of any evidence that it's actually good for you. And, and no evidence in, in uh, humans or in mice. Yeah, that's exactly what I why It's not I a bad idea. Well. I mean, right. it's, it's entirely possible. Uh, it's entirely possible that one or more of the members of that uh, biochemical cascade, including NR and including NMN, at some doses, at some ages, may have health benefits in people, may have health benefits in mice. I have seen a paper submitted for publication which involved one or more of those drugs in combination with other drugs, which seem to work together quite nicely. I can't say anything more about it, but I, I don't think it's a silly idea. I think it's a great idea. It deserves very careful attention. What I am arguing against is um, putting too much emphasis on very sparse data sets and making claims for human health benefits that are not really supported by evidence. I don't think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's that's why I'm asking you as well, because, you know, a lot of these companies sell the supplements for very high prices. And um, I, I, I just say that, well, we should also try to find the human evidence and the data. So I think consumers should be given that information. And that's all. <laughs> yeah, human evidence that a drug slows aging um, may well be very, very difficult to get. Mm -hmm. It's entirely possible that you have to take some healthy young 30 or 40 or 50 year old people, put them on the drug for two decades and see if it has a health benefit. No drug company ever will want to do that study. It's much too expensive. And the people who run drug companies need data within three years so that their stock prices will stay up or will continue to go up. Uh, no, nobody there wants to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in a risky study that won't produce answers for 20 years. Um, they, on the other hand, they can sell stuff that doesn't work as long as they don't call it a drug, as long as they call it a health supplement or something or a health food or something. They can sell that and make billions of dollars without having to have any evidence. So that's, that's the commercial path. That, that's the path that works well. 
it's possible that some of these drugs do slow aging, even in people, and we may never know it uh, uh, from human studies, human studies that meet the FDA criteria for approval. If we're really lucky, and I think this would be a very tough bet to take, but some people are taking it, it's possible you could give these drugs to people in their 60s and 70s for a decade, and maybe, just maybe, you'd slow that they show that they have a diminished risk of Alzheimer's, a diminished risk of cancer, diminished risk of diabetes, a diminished risk of stroke. That the FDA would be interested in because any one of those things is authentically a disease. And preventive medicines that prevent those diseases would be FDA approvable. But this would only work, this is an expensive study on its own. It's, I think, about a $50 million study as has been proposed for metformin by a consortium of 11 universities. Mm -hmm. It takes a while, and you have to sort of hope that the thing you're using will work even if started in people who are already quite old. That's right. Yep. Yeah, the, the metformin study, I think, is either ongoing or just about to start. I think it was halted because of COVID. And I last spoke to Dr. Nubar Zalai, who was conducting it. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, um, the head of the group is a guy named Steve Krzyzewski, and uh, Nir is a part of that team, and... Uh, um, a compelling advocate. He's he's very excited about it and does a great job of explaining why it's worth doing. And I, I agree with him. I think it's a will be a very informative study. You mentioned Matt Caberline, so certainly you're aware of the work that Matt and Dan Promislow and their colleagues are doing on dogs. They're starting with rabamycin, and I think mm -hmm. that is also likely to be very informative and to give more interesting, more informative results in the span of about five years. So. If they do find five or seven years from now that a drug like rapamycin is extending the average lifespan of dogs by a year or two and keeping them not just alive, but relatively healthy with a good sense of smell and good, good activity and good cardiovascular function, good hearing, um, I think that would be compelling evidence to suggest that that drug might be beneficial for people. The FDA won't won't approve that, but if you've got evidence that a drug extends lifespan in mice, extends healthy lifespan in dogs, the idea that it could do so in people becomes compelling, and then it's a matter of why is our medical establishment, our legal establishment, not able to work with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about Matt Kibberlein's work on, on, on dogs, so curious to stay updated on that. Um, so some of the other natural ones, for example, curcumin, you know, you hear all the time, oh, it's so good for you. Um, and similarly, green, tr green tea extract, you tested both of those as well. Did you see any health benefits or lifespan benefits? Yeah, when somebody says it's good for you, you should ask them with a critical eye, what evidence do you have? That is, Sometimes they'll say, see, you put it on cells and the cells live or mm -hmm. whatever marker you've got for so-called senescence. See, that goes away or something. And the relationship of that to whether you actually feel healthy and live longer and disease-free is obscure to non-existent. So whenever somebody says, I've got the very best curcumin on the market, I will really improve your feelings of youthfulness. <laughs> you really want to ask, show me the data and show me the method. Uh, otherwise, you're falling for a con artist, basically. Uh, curcumin, we tested in the ITP at one dose, had no effect. Uh, green tea extract is once one tiny bit more complicated. There's a standard test we use, it's called the log rank test. Uh, and using that test, the green tea extract did not have any benefit in males or females. However, when you look at the curve, there is a, a hint in females only, that the very earliest deaths may have been retarded. The overall lifespan was not increased, the median was not increased, the last 10% were not increased, but the early deaths were slightly slower, significantly slower. Um, so that's, that's the sort of the asterisk <laughs> that goes next to green tea extract. It could potentially have a female-specific benefit if you, if you narrow your focus to the earliest deaths. We're not going to chase that one down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, MCT oil, that's taken a lot of spotlight, I think, recently because of ketogenic diets or what have you. 
What did you observe with MCT oil? Oh, medium chain triglycerides. Yeah, that didn't work either. It's so worth, well worth testing, but it didn't work. And we were given a drug called Fisetin, which allegedly is a senolytic, allegedly right. it removes senescent cells. Uh, we tried that at two different dose regimes. It also had no benefit. Huh. But then at the, the mice we gave it to, they also didn't have any deletion of senescent cells. So um, we were neither able to reproduce the reported health benefit nor the reported change in senescent cells. Have you tested any of the other senolytic drugs like quercetin? No. No. Okay. So you tested only fisetin, didn't observe any results, didn't think it was worth promising. Oh, worth. We found no, no benefit and no harm okay. and no removal of senescent cells. If you have a company <laughs> and your company is peddling a so-called senolytic drug, uh -huh. you sometimes are very hesitant to let another lab test it. Right. Because if the other lab tests it and finds it doesn't work, that's not good for your company. It's not good for your <laughs> stock price. It's not good for your ability to sell the stuff. So many companies that are trying to sell bottles of an allegedly senolytic agent have no interest in our testing. So I'm, I'm just confused, I guess. There are all these papers that get published that, oh, Fisetine improved this metric or quercetine or, yeah. you know, green tea extract or I guess what are some of the other ones we discussed. Um, what, I mean, are they, do you think these studies are not being conducted rigorously? Or what is going on? How does a consumer even trust some of these papers coming out? Yeah, um, I think it's a complex situation. There's a very famous paper by a statistician named John Ioannidis, and the title of the paper is, is called Why Most Research, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. And his paper goes into great detail as to the ways in which um, the literature can be filled up with findings that appear on the surface to be convincing but are never replicated and don't turn out to represent the biological ground truth. Um, one of these is that uh, scientists tend to publish things that are positive but not publish things that are negative. And it's also the case, whether through self-deception, deliberate fraud or accident, uh, people who have a company trying to sell a drug tend to find that it works really well for them in their laboratories. Uh, in our Molecular Biology of Aging Journal Club here in Michigan, for fun, we assign the students two papers. Uh, one of them came from company A, and they show that drug A is terrific at removing senescent cells and producing all sorts of health benefits in mice. As a negative control, they use drug B. The other paper, which we teach on the same day, comes from the people who own company B. They sell drug B. In their paper, drug B worked great. It removes senescent cells and all sorts of health benefits. They use drug A as their negative control. So my own rule of thumb, I mean, some of these people may even have it right. You never know. Um, but my rule of thumb is I don't believe it until I see the work done over again by a group that doesn't sell the stuff. Um, that's one of the things about the ITP. We take no intellectual property and we have no financial stake in any of these drugs. So if we find one that works, that's thrilling. We publish it. We're really pleased with ourselves. The Aging Institute and the community of research scientists is really pleased with ourselves. If it doesn't work, we publish that anyway. And that's one of the reasons why companies who are trying to sell a drug are less enthusiastic about our working on it with them. We won't accept a drug unless the sponsors of the drug, the people who gave it to us, sign a statement saying that we get to publish the results. Whether they are positive or negative, they cannot repress the publication of our results. And every drug we ever study, we publish. And for many companies, they find that's not consistent with their commercial needs. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm so glad talking to you to clarify some of these points. There's just so much confusion in all the papers that comes out. Um, one, some of them may be right. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it could no, well no. be that these drugs actually work in people or in mice or in people and mice together. Yeah. It's just that to, um, 
cement the thing. I want to see the stuff with good, strong evidence for lifespan and pathology in mice or well-defined health outcomes in people. Uh, and I want to see it confirmed preferably by people who are not trying to make money from a company that is selling the drug. Right. So at the ITP, are you testing any health span biomarkers or is the focus mostly just on lifespan extension? For example, no, we, are you testing? We, yeah. we have two phases. Um, in the first phase, lifespan is the only endpoint. Okay. Uh, because if we threw in a lot of other stuff like strength and balance and cognitive function and inflammatory markers, we could only test half as many drugs. So mm -hmm. the, those first stages, we just want to push through as many drugs as we can. We have enough money to screen about seven each year. Now, if we have a winner, uh, we then do what we call a stage two study. We put a lot of the mice on the drug. Some of them are euthanized for pathology. Some of them are used for physiological tests of health. Uh, my lab tests a lot of this biochemical stuff I've been telling you about. Randy Strong's lab does a lot of the pharmacology. They look at glucose tolerance, something they're especially interested in. David Harrison and Nadia Rosenthal, they're at the Jackson Labs where they have lots of specialists in mouse behavioral testing and physiological testing. So they take some of the drug-treated mice. All of these health outcomes tests are um, really important and we incorporate them into our second run with any of the, the, the drugs that work. The other thing, and it's, it's sort of built into the philosophy of the program, once we have a drug that works, we publish it. And we're hoping that that is a stimulus so that the people who are really good at studying mouse hearing will study hearing in drug-treated mice. The people who are really good at studying um, bone diseases and uh, uh, neuronal turnover and cataracts and the heart, they will um, study with their special expertise mice treated with some of these drugs. The ITP has collaborative programs for all of these. I mean, every drug we test we put aside um, tissues, 11 tissues from 45 mice for each drug. So if a heart lab says, can I please have the hearts from the mice treated with this drug, this drug, and this drug, we say yes, and we ship it out the next week. So we are setting ourselves up for providing assistance and collaborative uh, help to any lab with sufficient expertise that wants frozen tissues from these drug-treated mice. If the test can only be done on live mice, like a test of memory, uh, we can assist them by providing them with the drug-treated food uh, or very small numbers of drug-treated mice. Okay. So it is possible that some of the drugs that were tested in phase one could have health span benefits but did not have lifespan benefits. Are you asking whether any of the drugs in our phase one studies might have improved lots of things but the mice then just dropped dead? Yeah, if they had, if they had health span benefits, like the mice were yeah, this is a popular and idea. older, and yeah, that's a very popular idea. Exactly, it's a very popular idea, and it's a shame. Um, the the people who used to run up until recently the division of aging biology were fascinated by this notion that health span and lifespan were really really different, and they saw them saw them as a seesaw. They were interested in health span, and the implication was therefore. You're not interested in lifespan. You're interested in one or the other. And health span was the flavor of the decade. But that's a very bad way to think about it. The reason that our mice live so long is they stay healthy for a long time. It's not that they're on a seesaw. They both go up together. Um, right. So although it's possible in theory, you could have a drug that makes you strong and fit with great cognition and no cataracts and excellent hearing, but you happen to be dead. It's not impossible, but there's no evidence for anything of that sort happening. It doesn't happen in caloric restriction. It doesn't happen in Snelldorf or Gerko mice or mice treated with acarbose or 17 alpha estradiol or rapamycin or, in fact, anything I know about. So our, we use lifespan as a, a screen, and I guess it's possible in theory that we might be missing a drug that makes the animals healthy on multiple dimensions without actually improving their mortality risk. It's not too hard to imagine this. I mean, if um, <laughs> let's say you're really interested in muscle aging, if you made the mice do push-ups every morning, by gosh, you would slow down the effects of aging on muscles. You would slow down cyclopenia. You can imagine a tissue-specific 
booster for one aspect of age sensitive physiological function. And I wouldn't be that interested in it. Uh, I'm interested principally in things that slow them all together. Uh, slow aging, not just of the muscles, but of the bones and the brain and the eyes and everything else, uh, and anti-cancer defenses most particularly. So for my money, the best time to actually do the studies of all of those important elements of health, those health outcomes, is when you have a drug that you already know works in the sense of that uh, postpones lethal illnesses. Mm -hmm. And all the ones we've ever looked at, not only do they postpone lethal illnesses, they also postpone stuff that is age sensitive, but not lethal, as we would guess, as we would have hoped. I, I, yeah, I think you might be right. I mean, I would think that health span goes coincides with lifespan. And now I'm even beginning to wonder if, you know, when people say, oh, there are health span benefits, but there may not be lifespan benefits, if that just ends up being a cover up uh, for some sort of study they're trying to push. I don't know. I think it's a fundamental, I think it's post mostly political. If you are the president of the United States, and this includes presidents I'm fond of and presidents I'm less fond of, and you say, we will cure cancer, your approval goes up. Everybody wants to cure cancer. Mm -hmm. But if that same president instead goes on TV and says, we're going to slow aging, and all the diseases of aging, he or someday she is considered crazy. What do you mean? You're going to slow aging? Don't be silly. No one can slow aging. And that's that's a matter of the political climate where, where the... Um, over in window is what people consider sensible scientific projection. Now, I don't think we're going to cure cancer. I don't think we're anywhere near having a pill or a procedure that will postpone lymphoma and colon cancer and breast cancer and brain cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in mice or people. But we do have one thing that does that. All of these anti-aging drugs do that. We can indeed slow cancer. And as a side effect, we slow hearing loss and we slow cataracts and we slow the loss of cognition, etc. So to my point of view, things that slow aging are eminently feasible. We have proof of principle now for at least four of them, plus two unpublished in mice. And that's the way to go. If you really seriously want to postpone Alzheimer's and cancer at the same time and all the other bad stuff. Mm -hmm. You really want to have something that slows aging. And we've got things that actually do that, fortunately. It's not just science fiction anymore. Couldn't agree more. Um, there are a couple of last longevity drugs that I wanted to discuss with you. One was fish oil. Were there any benefits with fish oil? No, I mean, you know, you've read our published papers. We tested it at two concentrations. It had no health benefits. It might have worked at a different concentration. It might have worked on a different diet. It might work in people. You never know, but it certainly mm. didn't work in mice. Okay. And spermidine and sulforaphane, is that part of the ongoing cohort or has that been tested already? No, each of them pose, poses its own difficulties. Sulforaphane, which is an inducer of the stress pathways related to NERF2, makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Unfortunately, it's exceptionally unstable. People in my lab spent a year trying to get sulforaphane into mouse food of any sort so that there was enough of it still left that it would boost NERF2 in the mice, and we failed. Um, we could never get enough active sulforaphane into the mice to have any pharmacological effect. So mm -hmm. I like the idea, but it didn't work out. We did a collaboration twice now with a, a group that had botanical agents that they thought would lead to NERF2 activation, just as sulforaphane does. We tested both of them. One of them did have a small but significant increase in male mouse lifespan. The maximum lifespan was not increased, but the average did go up. And then we tested another product from the same group, which they said was stronger, uh, and that had no benefit at all in either sex. So I still think it's a good idea, the idea of doing something like sulforaphane, but we haven't yet come across something you can stick in the food that actually produces a strong benefit. Do you I, think I it's the same it for humans where it's maybe just not absorbed as well? I, I, I don't know. Um, there's a company that um, is selling extracts of broccoli. They wanted us to test it, but sure. they wanted us to put 
mice on a diet that was 20% broccoli, and we decided not to do that. <laughs> uh, the other drug you mentioned was spermidine. Yeah. Um, a very fine uh, scientist, Frank Badeo, recommended that we try this, told us how much to use. And whenever before we start a lifespan experiment, we always give the mice the drug for eight weeks just to see if it gets in. And we put them on spermidine, and eight weeks later, we found no increase in spermidine in the blood or the mm -hmm. liver or any of the other tissues. Now, spermidine starts at a non-zero level. Mice make it all the time, so it's always there. So we were comparing the normal level, which is quite substantial, to the augmented level, which was the same as the normal level. So they said, oh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it takes six months before it starts to increase. Mm. We said, sure. So we gave it to mice for six months and then tested it in serum, liver, brain, and all the other tissues, and we saw no increase. It had no effect. So we were not willing to test a drug in mice unless we could prove that it was changing their intrinsic level of spermidine in at least one tissue. And there were no effects, no signs that adding the stuff to the diet modified spermine or spermidine levels in any of the tissues of our mice. So we gave up. I see. So do you know the, the scientists who maybe did work on spermidine, uh, were they giving it in a different way to mice or maybe they were just looking at the intrinsic spermidine levels? We, we used the amount they told us to use in the form they told us to use it. And when it was time to measure the amount in the tissues, we gave them the tissues blinded so they could use their methods to measure spermine and spermidine. And then when they sent us the data, we gave them the code. And it was at that point that we and they simultaneously concluded there was no effect of putting the stuff in the diet on either spermine or spermidine levels in any of the tissues whether we looked at eight weeks or six months. I see. Uh-oh. All right. Well, um, lastly, what are... I, I heard Brian Kennedy on an earlier version of your podcast right. saying he was, he was really down on uh, really good uh, in, uh, on spermidine and spermidine. He was going to try that in some humans. And I respect Brian, and I would certainly love to hear what evidence he has that the stuff has any effect. Yeah. Maybe, he, maybe he has evidence. Uh, I would like to hear what it is. Fantastic. Are there any other supplements or drugs that maybe you're excited about uh, that I haven't brought up, haven't discussed? Yeah, we, the, we have unpublished data that I'm allowed to mention, but we are not ready to publish it yet. And I'm only allowed to mention it if I include the statement that it's preliminary, that we have a lot of mice that haven't died yet, so the data are going to change, and that we have no mice dying yet at very old ages. So all of the data comes from mice that are either young adults or middle-aged. But both findings are really quite interesting because they're over-the-counter preparations. Uh, one of them is a, a product called astaxanthin. You can buy it at your local plum market or CVS store or other um, store specializing in so-called health products. Um, and the, the other of these is even better known. It's called meclizine. The trade name for meclizine is uh, dramamine or antivert or, or uh, bonine. I've actually taken that once. I went on a trip to Antarctica. It's an anti-sea sickness drug. It mm. helps you not get nauseous if you're on rocky seas. Um, so both of these drugs or health supplements or whatever you want to call them are available over the counter without a prescription. For that reason, someone has decided that they're non-harmful, which is always a great thing. The preliminary data so far suggests that both of them are going to be, once all the data are in, will have um, significant benefits in males. And we don't know yet about females uh, because the females are a little longer lived. It takes a few more months to get enough deaths in the female population to really be able to assess individual uh, compounds. So we don't know yet about females, but both drugs so far look pretty good for males. About a year from now, when 90% or more of the mice are dead. We'll do the official analysis. Hopefully, it will come out the same way. We'll publish the paper. And um, that will be really nice because it'll give two new tools whose mechanism of action can be explored. We can evaluate them for the sort of cellular changes I mentioned to earlier in our discussion. But also because um, if, if you're like Matt Caberline and Dan Promislow, and you're interested in products you could give to healthy adult dogs that are not going to hurt them and could potentially 
improve their healthy lifespan, these would be perfectly decent candidates. If it turns out they're sex specific, that, that also will give us new tools for trying to figure out why some of these drugs work only in males and some work in both sexes. Mm -hmm. So the first one you mentioned, what is it commonly taken for by people right now? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, a health it's a health supplement. The claims made, for, there are 10 companies that make the stuff. Um, it's actually <laughs> uh, legal to use it in people as a food coloring agent. Um, oh. So it's, it's being used for a wide, look it up uh, online, use Wikipedia for astaxanthin, get a mm. long list of industrial uses of the stuff and um, whether it is actually producing specific health benefits in people is not an area where I'm, I'm competent to comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you have any insights yet on the mechanisms by which either of these two might be working? Well, no. Um, the, the problem for any one drug is they usually do too many things, right? So um, if a given drug, you know, let's, let's take uh, Dramamine or, or Antivert or, or um, Meclizine. It, it's, it's known to make it more difficult to feel nausea, and it's an anti-vomiting agent. Uh, and it, the pathways in the brain that it activates to do that are ones involving famous neurotransmitters that modify, you know, your feelings of good health and how these are changed by uh, sea sickness. But that doesn't prove that those are also involved in lifespan. The drug could affect 10 different target enzymes, 20 different target enzymes, some of which are related to nausea and some of which are related to metabolic processes or cancer processes relevant to aging. Only when we've got, if we have eventually, strong data that it has a, uh, an anti-aging effect, will it be worth the effort to figure out how it's actually working there? It came to our attention because of a collaborating scientist, a, a man named Gino Cortopassi. Gino knew that rapamycin was an inhibitor of TOR, and he did a study of thousands of drugs uh, to say which of these are good at inhibiting TOR. And he, spent, he, he limited himself to FDA-approved drugs because he wanted stuff that um, wouldn't hurt people. And Meclizine came out very, very well as a TOR inhibitor. Hmm. And I thought that was a good reason to test it. Now, we don't know if it has a benefit. We don't know whether that benefit is going to be attributable to TOR inhibition or some other mechanism or multiple mechanisms. But that was the mechanism that Gino thought uh, raise this to the level that it deserved a, an expensive five-year lifespan study. Amazing. Yeah, one last thing I want to say. I mean, I, I read some of your writing pieces, um, the one on flying pigs and also the arbitrary in old mice, I think was just, was fantastic. You have a great sense of humor and a writing style. Yeah, thank you. We, the, the first time we had a mouse that was about to get to be four years of age, I, I was associated at a time with a website that Science Magazine had set up for biology of aging. And I asked them would they allow me to publish the birthday announcement of the mouse when it made it to four years of age. And they said, sure, sure, do that. And unfortunately, the mouse died 11 days prior to its fourth birthday. Uh, so they let me publish the obituary on the website. And it's also on my my lab's website at this point. Now, the Flying Pigs article pertains to claims made by Aubrey de Grey that uh, he and he alone can save it. Uh, he, he has an idea that if you simply follow the seven biochemical pathways that he has written down, you can stop aging in its tracks and people can live more or less forever. I thought this was silly. And so I wrote a parody of uh, Dr. de Grey's arguments as to ways in which seven specific interventions could be used to turn pigs into flying pigs. And that, that was published in the MIT alumni magazine, which had just recently published a seven page article exclaiming how, how thrilling it was that Dr. Gray's ideas had made it possible to, to stop the aging process or would soon be doing so. I, I thought it was time for another point of view. Both of these are um, 
available. You can download them from my website if, if you want to, uh, if you're interested in this, that sort of stuff. Good. I'll link to it. I thought it was very clever. Um, good. Is okay. there anything else that maybe I haven't asked you or you want to touch upon? Any last words? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to, to chat with you. Uh, I, the number of invitations people get to talk to sensible scientists about the biology of aging is at what I hope will be the very beginnings of an exponential rise. It's certainly a lot more this year than there were three or four years ago. And I think it's a sign generally that um, people are beginning to understand the potential for human health and disease prevention of strong anti-aging research and also gradually beginning to filter out the, the, the snake oil salesmen and those who are making ex extravagant claims to make some money um, from the good science and recognize that there is a good, after you've cleared all the junk away, there really is a core of exciting science that's coming along. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. It's taken too long, but I'm pleased to see it happening now. And so I'm delighted to participate in a, a show like this that has that as its central focus. Exactly. I, I do hope to uncover that for people and give people this helpful information. So thank you so much for your time today. It's been absolutely wonderful. Learned so much. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I'm blown away by the pace of longevity research. And I want to keep bringing you great conversations with longevity scientists themselves. If you want to support the creation of the podcast, consider sharing it, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, or signing up to be a premium member for show notes. All resources can be found at livelongerworld.com. As you all know, aging is universal. We can unite in this fight and be healthy forever. I can't wait and see you next time.